Welcome to the Rowdy Cards podcast on RowdyCards.com. I'm your host, Patrick Greeno, and today I have joining with me Brian Hayes of Lingua Sports Cards. You can check him out on Instagram at Lingua underscore sports underscore cards. And today we're going to be talking about three specific points, five minutes each, and we're just going to just dive right into it here. So uh, the first thing on our agenda tonight is um, collecting off the beaten path, definition, drawbacks, and benefits. Now, Brian, let's define what this means, right? Like, what is collecting off the beaten path to you? What is your personal definition of this? Uh, well, first of all, it's uh, it's great to be here, Patrick. Sure. Um, and uh, I'm really, really glad we can start with this question. Um, to me, uh, collecting off the beaten path is, uh, path is basically finding sets or players that aren't mainstream. So typically for players, you know, it, it might be players who are, uh, they might be all-stars, but um, in, in most cases, they are players of, uh, you know, lesser stature in the collecting community, um, going after cards that feature those kind of players. And then for sets themselves, uh, a lot of times, you know, there's a lot of mainstream brands uh, out there, uh, but with so many products out there, you can find different sets that maybe the the average collector isn't aware of. Um, so that's probably where I would start. And then definitely like, you know, oddball sets and like food issues, stuff like that, that, that would also sort of fall, fall into this category. Yeah, that, that's smart stuff. The way I collect is I, I typically and, and, and deliberately not chase what everybody else is chasing. You know, like, yes, I get 86 Fleer Jordan is a great card, but we have all seen that card a trillion times. And a trillion times over that. So it's like, you know, that that's fine. It's a great card. Maybe I'll get one someday. Maybe I won't. It doesn't really make any difference to me. Um, and and I'm sure I'll be super happy when I get one. Uh, but I, I feel like when I share a card like that to some, here's the thing. It's like I'm picking out a card, right? That's a great card. When I share a card that everybody else has seen or talk about and everybody gets excited about, I feel like it's not as, I'm not, I'm not, positioning new content i'm almost recycling content in a way it's everybody's excited about it great you know the, the ebbs and flows of that card or, or other cards like it um and those are great cards to have but i'm not reinventing the wheel with content it's everybody's talked a lot of people have talked about that card uh whereas if i talk about say you know we're talking about this austin kearns 2002 donner's elite aspirations number to 20 psa 9 is like Nobody talks about that card. Is it is interesting? I don't know. It depends on how you spin it, right? Like how you talk about it. And so that stuff doesn't sell that well because not everybody's chasing it. But and and the benefit to that is I can get it for cheap. Uh, the drawbacks is if I wanted to resell it because not everybody's chasing it, it'd be hard to sell. Um, the other piece of the drawback is that when we produce content around stuff that's being discussed a lot, it kind of just contributes to the noise of the stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you talk about something that's completely different, it might not be as searched as much. So SEO might not be as strong, uh, but it'll kind of cut through the noise and be like, oh my gosh, I didn't think about thinking about that card because nobody ever talks about it. So the benefit is that you're kind of cut through the noise. The drawback is that it's, SEO isn't really robust because not everybody's talking about it. Another benefit is you can get stuff at really good prices. So I want to yeah. talk about that because I think those are, that's a really good thing to think about that um, although the, the classic cards we all love are great cards to have in their excellent conversation pieces, there are other pieces that nobody talks about that are also very good conversation pieces. Yep. Um, and I'm going to throw on very quickly one, one example that I really like, and that is um, in the late 80s, uh, Tops, um, in their packaging for the, their hobby boxes, oftentimes they would have cards on the bottom of the box, like the box bottoms. Those cards um, people would, you know, cut out and are really hard to find now in high grade. And people really don't focus on those cards a lot. And um, they're sort of a, a sneaky hard, hard card cards to find uh, in high grade, but can still be had on cheap. They're just uh, cards that, you know, just once again aren't mainstream. But I really like those. And um, you know, I just thought I would throw that example out there. That's a good. That's a very good point. Those cards are highly condition sensitive because they're they're raw cards that are scraped around a lot because they're the bottoms of the box. Uh, they're hard to find in, in grades above six, really. Yep. I love them though. I love them because they're variations of the colors of the cards inside the packs. I just think they're so cool. I love that stuff. Ninety one Fleer did that too. And then I just I just think those are great cards. Good point. I'm glad we got to talk about that. So moving on to the next point here, uh, significance of card backs. 
Now, Brian, you talked about this a little bit. We've discussed this in passing over the years that that car backs have significance of themselves on their own as like, okay, the front of the car looks great. How does the back of the car look? And if the back is OC, like badly, like 90-10 style, but the front looks great, like are you drawn away from the card as much? Or or is it this, do you have to research and realize that all of the examples that have ever been graded have that flaw and you have to just pick one that looks good? What Where is your kind of benchmark on that? Yeah, for, for me personally, I I always look for 50-50 centering on card backs first. Like that's the ideal scenario. I care about that. And uh, it frustrates me sometimes when sellers only have photos of the card front. You know, I wouldn't buy a house without seeing the inside and the ho- the outside of the house. I would see, you know, check er- every place. Same thing with a car. If I like, if I'm going to go buy a car, I would look at the car from the outside, look from the inside. Same thing with cards. I want to see the front and the back. Um, I usually draw the line at about 70-30 on the, the the card back. If it's if it's worth worth centering that, like I, I just walk away. Um, and uh, it's just one of my. This is probably my number one pet peeve in the in the hobby is not it's online sellers not showing the front and the back of the card. I I get it for maybe. Um, you know, relatively cheap cards where it just might not be um, efficient from a time standpoint to to create two photos for for each card. But I've seen, you know, really, um, you know, expensive cards, you know, maybe let's say over a thousand dollars still uh, the seller only showing the card front. And I just I just walk away. Uh, sometimes I'll reach out to the seller and ask for a photo if I really want the card. But um, it, it's just uh, one of the uh, something that that annoys me uh, quite a bit. And I think part of this is maybe um, just sort of how I was introduced to the hobby uh, in the late 80s. I used the card back all the time. I always thought the the card back was the better part of the card because that's actually where, um, you know, I could read about the the player, they have statistics, uh, biographical data. Like I used the, the card back that had a utility. And I remember um, just going through card after card after card, learning about the players. And so I've always, always from the very beginning, um, given a lot of emphasis to what the card back looks like. Does it look good? Um, because it it makes for a complete card to have a good front and, and a card a good card back. I'm with you on that. I know that the further back we go with the age of the card, the more lenience I have to have on the the quality of the card back. Specifically, even just as early as the early, late 70s, you know, yeah. there's certain cards in 79 tops that I love, and finding them with the back centered is almost impossible. Eddie Murray is a good example. It's a that, great card, a great card, but trying to find one with the back that's got good centering is very difficult to do. Heck, finding one with the front centering is very difficult to do. Yeah, you know, the, the card back is actually one of my great frustrations with uh, 86 Fleer basketball. It's an awesome set. It's iconic. We all know that. Yeah. The the Jordan, obviously, is just, it's, you know, the, the icon, cards. Icon the card, cards. Yeah. But the card back, if you flip those cards over, you do have career statistics there, but there's a lot of blank space, which... I think it was a missed opportunity by Fleer. Like, write something up. Tell me about this guy. Because you got to remember, in the 80s, there wasn't, you know, internet all over the place. Cable was just coming into being. Cards were an opportunity to sort of educate the the viewing public about about these players. And I always appreciated it when companies put some time in, into the card back. So it's really, you know, starting with the the manufacturer of the cards. I think it's really important that everyone, uh, you know, consider the, the 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 card backs. And I mean, a lot of people do. Like I don't want to like overstate like th- th- this issue. Like a lot of card backs are great. They're they're awesome. Um, it's just uh you know from time to time you see things that uh, you know wish wish could be done a little bit better. Yeah, man, I'm with you on that. I know that uh, like s- certain players, the, well, their their statistics will take up the entire card backs. Players like Nolan Ryan, Pete Pete Rose, and Jamie Moyer specifically come to mind because they had these super super long careers. Um, but I I I appreciate. Even in the current market, Bowman having the three line items in the backs of the cards, you know, the up close resume, that kind of stuff. I like reading those things. And yeah, so I, I, do, I do appreciate that stuff because it gives me a little insight about somebody I've never met or probably never will meet. And I think that's cool. I do, I'm, I'm right there with you. Yeah. So good stuff. The final point we're going to talk about here is um, serendipitous eBay buys mimicking serendipitous card show buys. So, for example, I would pay the same for a card found at a, like on eBay. If I found it in a, in a bargain bin at a card show, perfect example. I, I brought this up earlier is this 2002 Donner's Elite uh, it's aspirations to 20 Austin Kearns PSA nine that I recently grabbed on eBay. It had surfaced two or three times, 999, you know, opening bid, no, no bids. And then the guy eventually listed an, an OBO option. I floated him an offer and he countered and I accepted. 
So I got it for like $7.50. What a great card to have. It doesn't really fit into my collection because it's not a rookie card. Uh, it would yep. be like more closer to a rookie year card. And so uh, stuff like that's really cool to have. Just It'll scan really well, too. It comes to the, the status aspirations parallel sets. Those, those sets always scan really well. And they're just cool looking sets. Great die cut. Um, and so it, it'll be a nice ad. But if I had found this at a bargain at a card show in a bargain bin, I, I'd have bought it for 750 like immediately such a cool card to have so that stuff though those prices those spendings those dollars they add up so you have to kind of like curb your enthusiasm when you're searching ebay and finding this stuff like just all randomly on the the suggested searches like you might also like this those things are tempting by the way those suggested searches you like have to really control yourself on that stuff you know um so no, tell me, was there one specific, can you can think of a specific instance for you, like you bought a card because it was suggested to you and you wouldn't have searched for it otherwise? Yeah, um, so that happens uh, qu quite a bit. Um, actually, I have an example from uh, th th this week, actually. I, uh, um, I'm a big uh, Zach Greinke fan. I like the Royals and I've been following Greinke, Greinke's career for a long time because he, he came up with the uh, with, with the Royals, and um, I was looking for some of his earlier cards. He's got a 2002 Bowman Chrome draft picks and prospects. Um, and there's a couple of versions out there, and uh, I've been trying to find uh, an example for for my PC. Uh, but when I was doing a, a search from that um, online, um, just a recommendation on eBay showed up for a, a super fractor of of Grinky, um, and uh, I, I went after it, and I was able to. To win, win, win that card, and so um, you know that's something that I would say happens to me quite fre frequently um, online when I'm searching. I get the recommendations, and then I pursue it online. As far as card shows go, um, it doesn't seem to to happen as much for me at, at card shows. Um, I think when I go to um, card shows, I quite honestly I, I tend to stick um, sort of in the the showcase uh, areas of that that dealers have, and I don't really sort of pick through. Um, you know, different bargain bins or $10 bins, but whatever. And so uh, I guess my point is like, I, I tend to, when I'm looking at sort of the showcase, have more focus as to know what I want. And if I see what I want, then I'll sort of pursue it. I'm sort of like zoning in on a certain card that, you know, I, I might be looking for. And I, I try to have that focus at shows. I, I tend to be maybe a little bit less flexible than online because I, I feel like it shows I think when I was younger I would I would um, maybe lose focus and make like an impulse purchase um, and just not feel great about it later on and so I, I, I find myself at shows beforehand trying to, to think of w what I want to uh, obtain from that show and if I don't see it then you know just be happy um, coming home with just the experience and not any cards um, online I feel like generally speaking you know, because you can see stuff, you have a little bit more time to, to think about things. And I, I feel like that gives me more flexibility because I feel like I'm making less Im impulse buys, I, I would say for me. That's good, man. See, I'm the other way around. I, I look at showcases, but I rarely buy things from showcases. Okay. I go, I almost go straight to the boxes, like on the side that looking for like at this show over the weekend, I, I, I did that and picked up a Nolan Ryan card I'd never seen in my life, like a variation. I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't. What the heck is this? I have to get it. It's a slabbed, yeah. it's a slabbed car. It's ten dollars, but it, I've never seen this variation ever. And so I'm probably I have to do the review of the show and I'll showcase it in there so people can see it. But um, that stuff is that's that's kind of the serendipity that I that I that I embrace because it's so interesting. Such weird, cool stuff can be found in in little nooks and crannies of the hobby. So I'm glad we get to talk about that. Uh, that concludes this particular podcast. Thank you, Brian Hayes, for, for joining me. Again, you can follow Brian Hayes on Instagram at Lingua Sports Cards. That's his handle is Lingua underscore sports underscore cards. Thanks again, Brian Hayes, for joining me for this podcast. Do you have any final thoughts? Uh, no, it's just uh, this was great, uh, Patrick. I enjoyed it a lot and uh, look forward to more in the future. Thanks for tuning in to the Rad Cards podcast and radicards.com. I'm your host, Patrick Greeno. And until next time, enjoy collecting. If you like this content, please subscribe. Thank you. Enjoy collecting.